You, yes, you. Stop what you're doing and let me tell you about the single most important math fact you'll ever use in your life. Forget about algebra, forget about geometry, because the dominated convergence theorem is where it's at. But let me give you a little bit of motivation. So suppose you have a sequence of functions fn that goes to f as n goes to infinity pointwise. Pointwise means it goes to f at every point, meaning that for all x, we have that fn of x converges to f of x as n goes to infinity. And this makes sense because this is just convergence of numbers. This is a number you ask it to converge to this number. So in terms of a picture, here's what it looks like. You have a bunch of functions fn so think of this as F1, and maybe this is F2. And those functions at every point, they converge to a function F. So again, it means that for every X, no matter which we choose, Fn of X goes to F of X, which at least it's true in, for this X. And here's the question. Suppose Fn converges to F pointwise. Does it or does it not follow that the integral of Fn of x dx converges to F of x dx? So is it true or not that the limit as n goes to infinity of this integral equals to the integral of the limiting function? In other words, is it true or not that the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of fn of x dx equals to the integral of the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x dx? In other words, is it true that you can pass into the limit under an integral? Can you put a limit inside this integral and Unfortunately, the answer is no. In general, it is not true that you can put a limit inside an integral. And in fact, let me give you a counterexample. It's very interesting. Take fn of x. Again, this is all on R to be n times the indicator function of the interval 0 comma 1 over n. So in other words, it's the function that is n on 0 comma 1 over n, but 0 otherwise. And in fact, let me draw a couple of pictures of what's going on. So let's do f1, what it is. This is the interval 0 comma 1. And this function is 1 on that open interval, but zero everywhere else. And to emphasize, it is zero at zero and one as well. So this is F1. What about F2? In this case, the interval is zero comma one half. And this function, this time, it is two on the interval zero comma one half, but zero everywhere else. So again, to emphasize it is 0 at 0, 0 at 1 half, but here it is 2. So that's f2. And in general, for fn, you just do it on a very small interval, 0 comma 1 over n. And it is n here, and then 0 everywhere else. So you see, it is a function that is getting bigger and bigger but over a smaller and smaller interval. And in fact, you may ask what happens in the limit. Well, the, in the limit, this function is becoming so tiny that it actually converges pointwise to the zero function. So claim fn converges pointwise to f, which is identically the zero function. And this is not very hard to show because you just do it by cases. If 
x is less than or equal to zero, so kind of here, well, notice fn of x is always zero. Equals zero for all x. So fn of x, which here becomes the zero sequence, converges to the zero sequence, which is precisely f of x. Because f is a zero function. And suppose x is positive. So suppose x is here. Well, just choose n to be so large that 1 over n is less than x. Choose n so large that 1 over n is less than x, but then x is outside that interval. And by definition, fn of x equals 0. And in particular, if you take the limit, then the limit as n goes to infinity of fn of x is still 0, which is f of x. So in post, both cases we're done. If x is negative, fn is always 0. And if x is positive, just wait enough time so that 1 over n is less than x. And then you're done by definition. So we have rigorously proven now that those functions fn of x converge to a 0 function. But then the question is, what about the integrals? What about the areas under the functions? Well, here, the area is 1. Because you know, the base is 1, the height is 1. Here, the area is 1 half times 2, which is 1. Which is 1. Well, here, the area of fn, it's n times 1 over n which is 1. So in each case, the integral of fn is actually 1. But if you take the integral, again, over r of fn of x dx, which again, we've calculated to be 1 over n times n, which is 1, this integral does not converge. Let me put it in red. It does not converge to the integral of the limit function. So it does not converge to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x, which by definition would be the integral of the zero function, because fn goes to zero, which would be zero. Therefore, the end of this cautionary tale is, in general, the integral of fn does not converge to the integral of f, even though fn converges to f point one which of course raises the question, when is it true that the integral of fn converges to f? And luckily, there's a theorem with very mild conditions that actually tells you when that happens. And that's what's called, again, drum roll, the dominated convergence theorem. So theorem. DCT, okay. it's not like Dominican central time, no, no, no. It's the dominant convergence theorem. It simply says the following, if Fn converges to F pointwise, which again, in our assumption we already had, and moreover, all those functions are dominated by another function G. So fn of x in absolute value is less to equal to g of x for all x, but not just a random function. This dominating function needs to have finite integral with g of x dx finite. So under this very mild condition that fn is less to equal to g for all x with g finite integral, then in fact, we can pass into the limit. So then the integral of fn goes to the integral of f. So again, let me illustrate with a picture. Suppose you have a bunch of wild functions. So fn, again, super wild, super wild. And 
they converge to some f. If all those functions are dominated by a function g, could be wild, but whose integral is finite, so think like whose area is finite, then in fact, the area under fn converges to the area under f. So under this very mild assumption, which is valid 90% of the time, you can actually pass into the limit. The only thing you need to watch out for is that this G doesn't depend on N. So this doesn't depend on N. On N, and you need to make sure that this integral is finite. So again, for the third time, if all the Fn's are dominated by a function whose integral is finite, then you can easily pass into the limit, which again tells you most of the time you can pass into the limit because most of the time this uh, thing is satisfied. In particular, in my future videos, I will never check for the DCT assumptions. Whenever I pass under an integral, just think, okay, pi m is using the DCT, because again, 90% of the time this is true. And in fact, let me give you an example just to illustrate that. Okay. Suppose we have the following. And again, this is something that happens, for instance, when you solve Laplace's equation. So suppose g of x has a finite integral might be our dominating functions, I don't know. And f is differentiable. Again, this is in R. And the derivative is uniformly bounded. So it's bounded by a constant c, which is finite, and that's for all x. So again, the c doesn't depend on x. The question is, does this following difference quotient converge? So does the integral of g of x times f of x plus h minus f of x over h dx. Well, it should converge to g times f prime. But the question is, is that true? Does this go to g of x f prime of x dx? In other words, is the limit what we want it to be. And of course, you're like, wait a moment. Why do you do h goes to 0 before we had n goes to infinity? No problem. First of all, the dominated convergence theorem also works for our real numbers, not just uh, n's. And the fact that h goes to 0, uh, you can just let n be 1 over h. And if at least h goes to 0 plus n goes to infinity. The point is the uh, dominated convergence theorem is a very chillax theorem, you know, has very mild assumptions, which you can modify. So in other words, does the limit of this function go to whatever we, what, the stuff we want? Well, for this, let's just use a dominated convergence theorem. So usually I use Fn, but because here we have H, we use Fh, and all that's left to show so it's enough to show that this fh for point y, so we are enough to show that fh of x is dominated by a function g squiggled of x, where the integral of g squiggled is finite. Okay. So once you show that, then the answer is yes. That's the beautiful thing. And well, let's do that. So what is uh, fh, again, fh, that's g of x times f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Now, here's the thing. That's why I like this Microsoft whiteboard. We have info about f prime. because We know f prime is bounded. So the question is, how do you turn this into a derivative? I'll just use the mean value theorem. What do you mean? Yeah, the mean value theorem. And it just tells you that, remember the MVT, 
It's the MVP of uh, calculus theorems that tells you that f of x plus h minus f of x over h equals to f prime of c uh, for some c. Little c between x and x plus h. By the way, just a little rant. In the in analysis, never ever use the mean value theorem because we have no control over this c. Suppose, for instance, f is measurable almost everywhere. Well, this c could be this almost, you know. So in general, not good to use the mean value theorem. Uh, instead, what I would recommend, write this as an integral and use the fundamental theorem of calculus. But because this is just an illustrative example, I will just write it like that. And so fh in the end becomes g of x times f prime of c. I don't know why it did that. but. All right, muy bien. And the nice thing is, this allows us uh, to estimate this, because what do we have? f of h of x equals g of x times f prime of c. Just FYI, this c might depend on x. We have to be watch out for that. But luckily, we don't have to worry about this, because remember, f prime is bounded by a constant that doesn't depend on the input. So by assumption, we know this is less than or equal to capital C. And again, in case you don't remember, look at this. So this thing is less than or equal to capital C times G of X. But also, what do we know about G? Well, G has finite integral, which is actually what we want. And therefore, Again, we need to show that this integral is finite, but that's not very hard now because f h of x dx is less than or equal to this constant times the integral of g of x dx. And we now know all of this is finite. So what do we have? This function f of x, point-wise, it converges to what we want, g of x f prime of x, and it's dominated by, I guess, this number or by this function here, okay, which has finite integral. And therefore, by the dominated convergence theorem, the answer is yes. I guess, yes. Uh, namely, the integral of fh as h goes to 0 goes to what we want. So in this case, uh, f prime times g. Or in other words, the limit as h goes to zero of this thing, f of x plus h minus f of x over h times g of x actually goes to uh, what we want. So f prime of x, g of x, dx. And you may wonder why is that, why do we care about this? Well, because essentially whenever we put a derivative inside an integral, we're actually doing this whole process. So, so again, whenever you see someone in PDEs, put the derivative inside an integral or put a limit inside of integral, they think about the dominated convergence theorem. And I used to do that when I started learning PDEs where I just you know, wrote this as a different quotient and like you know, tried to verify the assumptions. But after a while, you'll see, well, most of the time they're satisfied, so it's good. All right, I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.